So this morning, I'm going to be preaching a little bit out of the book of Matthew. And has anybody in here ever been prideful? Has somebody chuckled? Has anybody ever been prideful? <clears throat> has anybody ever got to the point in their life where they say, look what I can do? Look, Because everybody likes to be recognized, right? People like to do a good job. They like to perform well. They want to be recognized. This is universal, church. Everybody likes to do a good job. Uh, you, you, it starts when you're early. What happens when your kids, you give them a coloring box and crayons and they scribble a little blob, right? Some parents are out there saying, no, that's art. They scribble a little blob on a piece of paper, they take it to your mama, and your mama says, I'm so proud of you, you did so good. And what happens? You're like, I did so good. You feel so good about yourself because you did so good. So it's very easy to become prideful even at an early age. Now, a lot of us would say, well, how is that prideful? Well, prideful can take forms in various ways. And if unchecked, it can be very unhealthy. We're going to talk about pride this morning. Matthew 18, verse 1 says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, you have to keep in mind that these were men chosen by God. Uh, God was developing, or Jesus was developing their character. He was calling them out to do different things. He was putting, through them, putting them through trials and tests to change their character. But at this time, they came to Jesus, and it reveals something about their character at this time. And they say, Jesus... Who will be the greatest in heaven? That sounds like a prideful statement, doesn't it? Who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so Jesus, doing what he does, he creates an example and shows them. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, and that... Converted means to change course and change direction. Unless you're converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he's telling this to his chosen disciples, his chosen people, and he's teaching them. Unless you become like a small child. And so what is it about the small child that he wants to show the disciples. He's wanting to show them their humility, their, their reliance on not themselves. Because small children, they don't know how to do much, do they? Um, it's like, I can't tie my shoelaces. I can't, I, I can't find my clothes. Mom, where's my clothes? Mom, I can't find the bread. It's in the cabinet right next to everything else, right next to the coffee. I don't know where that is. Small children don't know how to do much on their own, amen? So they have to rely on someone else. And this is what Jesus was trying, the point he's trying to get across to his disciples, that they need to rely on the Father. Unless you are converted and become as little children you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We're going we're gonna to go into Matthew chapter 4 and read a scripture because this was something that Jesus said earlier in time. He said, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is preaching and teaching, and he says, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we read that earlier in the passage of scriptures we just previously read, and he says, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're like a child. And so the notes that I wrote on this, it says that repentance 
takes a, a certain amount of humility to be able to say, God, I can't do this on my own. And I need Jesus to admit. I need Jesus. And I have to admit that I'm a sinner. See, that, that takes a certain amount of humility to do that. People that are prideful, they say, I can do things on my own. I can get it done, right? How many of you men are handy around the house? Nobody wants to raise their hand like, Pastor Clay setting me up, and I'm not going to trust that guy. <laughs> men commonly like to be identified as being handy. I can do things. I, I can get things done. I'm a go-getter. Anybody ever heard that one? He's a real go-getter. And that's okay to be a go-getter, but whenever you decide that, well, I can do things on my own and I really don't need God, it's very hard for people that have that attitude, it's very hard for them to come to Christ because they do not see the need because they can do things on their own. Amen? You must become like a child and realize that you are dependent on someone else other than yourself to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Amen? We go back to chapter 18. which it was talking about a child. Verse 4, Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Whoever humbles themselves, whoever sets aside their pride and says, God, I can't do this without you. I cannot do this without Jesus. They are the greatest in the kingdom. Verse 5, Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and if he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Now, you have to read that bottom passage of scriptures about uh, offending a child and read it in the context of that whole passage of scriptures because it says that it would be better to cut your own hand off. And what that's talking about is, is in the context of pride. If there's something in your life that is, makes you so proud, maybe it's your own abilities, maybe it's your job, maybe it's that new car, you know, that new red sports car you just got. I, I, don't, I hope nobody in here just got a new red sports car because I might be talking to you, I don't know. Maybe it's a new truck that's jacked up. It's got 30-inch 30 30 tires on it. It could be anything. It could be the new house that you desire. It could be anything. The Bible says, is it better? Because it sounds extreme, right? If you're going to cut your hand off or you're going to pluck your eye out, that sounds pretty extreme, right? But would it be extreme in the context that it would be better to have one eye and go to heaven, then have both your eyes and go to hell. It sounds extreme, but what are you willing to sacrifice? 
Are you willing to give up the thing that you hold so near and dear to you? Whether it's that great, big, fancy, nice house or new sports car or brand new truck that's got 600 horses and it's a diesel and it's got a turbo and it doesn't use any hard fuel. So it's, it's basically like paying myself to have it, you know. Right? And I, I'm not saying things are bad. I'm not saying things are bad. But when we come become so prideful of them and they puff us up in our spirits. Look at me. Look at what I got. See, I was at, we went to Amarillo yesterday and we had to, we was going to get our son a new cell phone because sometimes he comes home by himself. And so we went to go to the cell phone store and I walk into the cell phone store and we went to T-Mobile and we went to the small cell phone store because there was nobody in there. And Christy said, do you think it'll take very long? And I lied to myself. And if you've ever been to a cell phone store, you know what this lie is, right? Oh, this won't take very long. If you ever go to a cell phone store, you just might as well take a tent because you're going to be there for a while. Amen? Go to the cell phone store and I go to the counter and there's a young, like 20-year-old guy standing there and I'm talking to him, telling him what I want to do. And he looks at me and I'm, I'm wearing this watch that I've got on right now. And he looks at my watch and he's like, that's a really nice watch. And I was like, what? Because I had my wife order this off of Amazon and it was like $12. And so when he tells me it's a really nice watch, I'm like, he's making fun of me. This punk is, that's a really nice watch. You got you an old man watch, is what I was thinking. And so he, I was like, yeah, I bought this for like $12 on Amazon. And we go to, we have to get transferred to the other cell phone store, the big one. We can't do that here because we ain't got that phone. Let's go to the other one. That sounds like a great time, right? So we go to the other one, and the other guy's supposed to help us, and we go in the store, and we spend a couple hours there also. But during the time of this, I'm standing there, and that kid, he looks at my watch, another kid, 20, 22, 23. He's like, man, that's a really nice watch. And I was like, did, did the kid from the other store call this kid and say, hey, there's an old man in there with a black plastic watch. Make fun of him for me, would you? And I said, okay. Uh, I said, I paid like $12 for it on Amazon. And he's like, is it a G-Shock? A Casio G-Shock? Now, I don't know anything about Casio G-Shocks. Except when I grew up, a Casio G-Shock watch was a cheap watch. Right? I don't know if anybody remembers those times. A Casio watch was not anything to be desired. Evidently, that is not the case anymore because I came home last night and I, I got to thinking about it. I told Christy the story because she didn't hear the kids say that. And so I looked up Casio G-Shock watch. And apparently my watch, my $12 Amazon watch, is a very good knockoff of a very expensive Casio watch that cost about $600. Yeah, I'm like, you ain't even, you just get you a fake one, right? You can have, you can have all the pride that you want for $12 <laughs> instead of $600. You can say, hey, look at me. I got a cool watch. That's a funny story, but I was thinking about that. And there's people out there that will go and spend $600 on a watch that was never cool. Just so they can say, I spent $600 on a watch. And if you think that people don't recognize, see, that's the motivation behind 
having nice things a lot of times. Not always. If you buy a pickup because you need it and you need to haul something heavy, be my guest. But to get to the place where you say, I'm going to have to buy me a $600 watch just so somebody can notice me and say, man, that's cool. Then there's something wrong, church. Amen. Amen. That is prideful. That is prideful. The sin of pride. The sin of pride is an excessive preoccupation with self and one's own importance in achievements, status, or possessions. This sin is considered rebellion against God because it attributes to oneself the honor and glory that is only due God. The Bible says that all honor and all glory and all praise is His and His alone. But God, you ain't got one of these. God's like, you know what? I can tell time by myself. I don't need a Casio. Pride is the opposite of humility, a character quality that greatly pleases God and one He rewards. For us to be humble and say, God, I need You. I can't go through a day without you. God, I look to you for everything, my provision, my healing, whatever it may be. God, it is all about you and only you. And there is nothing that I have to offer in this equation because it is still all about you. First Peter chapter five, verse five says this. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Now, it is not God's desire to humiliate you. There's a difference between being humiliated and being humble. Being humble is a character attribute that God can put into your spirit, or you can work towards to say, God, I submit myself to you and everything that you are. Being humiliated is a totally different thing. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time." The humble will be exalted by God. There will be a day on judgment day. There'll be a time on judgment day. God will lift us up, the ones that are humble, the ones that have said, God, I need you. God, I'm a sinner and I got to have Jesus because he died for me and went to the cross for me and he shed his blood for me. It says in there that God resists the proud, and I preached a specific sermon on this before, but that particular passage of Scripture that says God resists the proud, that, that passage of Scripture right there means to set into battle formation against. So that's God, that is God's attitude towards the proud and the prideful that he sets up in battle formation. It's a military term. He sets up in battle formation against the proud and prideful. That's a scary thought, church. Amen? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The, the prideful looks of man. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty. Upon everything lifted up. And it shall be brought low. Everything that is prideful, the word of God says that it shall be brought low. Low. 
Amen? Everything that we think as a society that's important. And so there's a difference here because we can look at the way the world is through the eyes of the world and we can see sports stars and actors and big houses and movies and all that stuff. And, and there's people that are... I read an article about a lady that made a movie and they paid her like $10 million to make this movie. And she was upset because she didn't get like $30 million. And she's like, I am the actor of the movie. You should pay me that much. But guess what? All of that stuff, all of the people that think they're important in this world, the Bible says that they, that pride will be brought low. Amen. Amen. That might be a, a tough pill to swallow, but there's good news because God has called us to be humble, church. Everyone in here, God has called us to be humble, humble and not prideful. What does it say about the humble? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, also must do. See, it's very hard to think about others as the body of believers. That's what we're called to do is to think about others instead of ourselves. But when we're full of pride and our own abilities and our own things, we have our focus on ourselves and not others. And that's another reason that pride is so damaging and so hurtful to the Christian walk. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. It's hard to love other people when all you can do is love yourself. And there's a fly attacking me. It's hard to love other people when all you love is yourself. Amen? So if we look at this objectively and we think about what God has called us to do, to walk in humility and not be prideful, and say, well, why is that important? If you need another reason besides the other ones that I've given you, I'm going to give you one last reason. Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, He was in heaven with God the Father, and He chose to come to this earth in the form of a human to walk this earth to do ministry, to serve others. Amen? He served others, and then he went to the cross. He was beaten, he was whipped, he was mocked, he was broken and bruised, and he was nailed to a cross, he was spit upon, and there was no pride in any of that of any of those events that Jesus would say, you know what? I'm so full of myself that I'm going to go to the cross. He humbled himself. Jesus Christ humbled himself on this earth to the glory of God the Father. And so for us to say that we want to be like Christ, but we want to be elevated, it makes no sense that we must humble ourselves to be like Christ. And that's a really sobering thought, amen? It's hard to think, hey, 
just because I'm a Christian, I might have to eat my pride. If somebody says something hateful to me, I, maybe I shouldn't respond. You can't talk to me that way. Don't you know who I am? Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to return to the stage at this time. And I realize that hearing a message about pride can be difficult sometimes because I might be stepping on somebody's toes. I might be stepping on my toes. Because like I said, it's ingrained in us from a very early age to do well. You get, you get your kids' handprints, they get paint. They get paint and they put their handprints on a piece of paper. And your mom and dad, oh, it's so beautiful, you're going to be the next Picasso. Really, it's, it's just handprints. But God has called us to be humble, church. Not just humble for the sake of being humble either, but humble so you can pour out love on those around you and you not think of yourself, but you can think of others. And that's, that's probably the harder part of all the equation. It's easy for people, well, I'll, I'll be humble if you don't believe if you don't believe it, just ask me. I'll tell you how humble I am. Right? But there's purpose in it. It's hard to be offended when we're humble. When we recognize our place in Jesus Christ. You know, I don't have to be offended because I know that my God is greater than all of this. Amen? Let's rise to our feet. I'm going to pray for you guys. These altars are open. God is good. Let's bow our heads. Father, we come to You this morning in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that You would put it in our hearts. And this is a dangerous prayer, God, but put it in our hearts that we are nothing without You. God, don't let us be prideful. Let us recognize that we need You. God, so we can lift up the name of Jesus. We don't lift up the name of Clay Reynolds. We don't lift up the name of anybody else. We lift up the name of Jesus. Because Your Word says that if You're lifted up, You will draw all men unto You. Amen? Amen.